Um, since the subject is basically happiness, I am going to make all of you stand up for a second, kind of loosen up. Let's open up, <laughs> try to hear. And if you have any comments, anything you want to say of why I'm doing a tech robot presentation with the subject of happiness, feel free to ask. I'll make it interesting going forward. Feel free to cut me off at any time. You don't need to raise your hand. Just start talking. I'll at some point stop and accommodate. So kind of move around, get a little energy. <laughs> Once you guys look happy, I'll allow everyone to be seated. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. Uh, as he said, my name is Bahar, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Case One. I like to call myself the chief inspiration officer. Luckily, I have a job that I can walk around and you know, come up with all of these you know, dreamy ideas and magically have my partner and our you know, great development team turn them into uh, what I call magic bots <laughs> to fix all of my problems. So, a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about, I'm sure you guys can relate to. Um, maybe some of it from, is from a little bit of a law firm perspective. Maybe some of it applies more to your team. And I will work that in of why it's important to even keep your team happy and keep uh, your internal people happy. So feel free to jump in and just let's make it a discussion. I know before it was supposed to be a panel or a round table discussion, so let's turn this master class into um, something that we can all interact with and I'll learn something from you guys and I can implement it in my life which is the whole point of all of these events on the networking. So today I'm going to talk about mastering happiness and you might wonder why. Why is that important? Why does happiness matter at all? And hopefully by the end of the session we can walk away and have a conversation in the next couple of days and see how happy everybody really is in their jobs and our chosen professions. So, as you can see, the title was uh, You Can't Find a Good Lawyer, Hire Robots, and it's unleashing creativity and becoming supernatural as, as human lawyers. So what's the difference between a human and a robot? In my opinion, it's really the intellect, the analytical thinking, the creativity, the emotions. So it boils down to two things, your heart and your mind. But all of us know that that's not always the case now with lawyering and the entire process of what the practice of law has become. Um, I heard a lot of really interesting presentations today. If I don't remember the names or everyone or if I pick on you, just cooperate. Um, all of those interesting subjects that we spoke about, um, they were all about the analytics of actual lawyering. It was about the skills of lawyering. It was about going to law school. But we never talked about the process of lawyering. Now you came up with this great creative solution to fight off a lawsuit, but what's the process behind that? Who does the paper pushing? Who does the form filling? Who does the 90% that gets you from the start of a litigation case or any other case, transaction, whatever you guys want to think of, to that end result where you get that 10 minutes of fame and glory to present your creative idea that most of us want to find a way to patent anyway. And all of us have heard the question, so why did you become a lawyer? Most of the time this question comes up after some drinks, some hanging out with some people, and they're usually surprised by someone as seemingly as nice as you or me or you know everyone around you is a lawyer. If you're like me, you've developed this generic answer of when people ask you what kind of a law do you practice or what kind of a lawyer are you. I usually respond with an awesome one. I, by the time I want to explain what I actually do, I've lost them. So this answer kind of has started to work for me. And being an awesome lawyer doesn't always mean that you have an awesome life. As a matter of fact, the more awesome you are, the busier you are, and the less time you have to stay awesome. That's when you get buried in all the paperwork and you lose kind of your reputation, you miss calls, and we know where that goes. So I want you to take the next few minutes, let's see if this works, to just ask yourself, why did I become a lawyer and why do I remain one? I'm sure we all had hopes and dreams. In my case, I did. <laughs> I was young, full of hopes and dreams, thinking, oh great, you know, law school was the best experience of my life. Every day I thought, you know, let me just get through this day. I'm going to be an international human rights attorney and change the world. 
I graduated, as you all know, got my first job at a relatively large litigation firm. And I was shocked to find out that that's what lawyering is, being buried in paperwork, answering to everyone, keeping track of your time, just billing, billing, billing. I didn't even know how to bill, let alone in, in a whole new practice area. So that was eye-opening pretty fast. And the hopes and dreams quickly faded and got replaced with the concerns of paying student loans off and hitting my billing requirements, working for actually an outside firm to multiple insurance companies, answering claims adjusters on legal issues where they didn't care about. It was about numbers. And their response to me was, it would cost me less to settle this case than cover your fees. So they chose the strategy in the case. They told me to settle the case because I was more expensive. And that just slowly and slowly killed my hopes and dreams <laughs> faster and faster. And after just a few months, I excelled at all of my tasks. I had the largest caseload in the firm. I had the highest settlement rate. I had the highest billables. And I had um, the biggest caseload. Not because I found some magic tool or work 90 hours a week, just because I found a pattern in the process. And I found a more efficient way to, to do the things manually. We were fully paper-based. And I was still doing manual work. But I started repeating the same tasks and processes through recycling some of my old work, bringing down my billables per task or per case, which meant I got way more referrals. And they, um, the insurance companies requested to work with me. I kept their costs down. But I brought in quantity. Now, it wasn't the greatest way to solve my problems, but it was the only thing I could think of at the time to make me more efficient. The better I got at my job, the faster I moved up, and the unhappier I got. The busier I got, the unhappier I got. My parents always told me to pursue um, what I love. And their saying was, pursue what you love. And if you love it, you'll work hard at it. Hard at it. If you work hard, you'll be the best at it. And if you're the best at it, success will naturally come. It took me a while to understand what success really is to me, which was happiness and contentment. I wasn't passionate about doing what I was doing anymore. And most, although most of the elements of success were there, the key ingredient of being a lawyer, which was passion, was missing. If any of these words, like equal protection, um, let's just go down the road. Equal protection, due process, probable cause, unreasonable search. If any of these words trigger something in you, that means you're in the right job. That means you have the passion to be in the right job. And that doesn't apply to everyone. Some people have the passion to be transactional lawyers. But the passion is to help people. That help could be, in my case, doing human rights and whatever. But the whole passion in helping people is helping them solve a problem. You leave them in a better place uh, than you found them. You, you help them. You consult them. You walk them through a process that they didn't know where it would end up, where it would lead them. You lead them to a solution. Lawyers are entrusted to help people balance competing interests through a process we call pursuit of justice. It's a little wordy, and we're getting a little emotional, but I'll, I'll pass through. And in my opinion, that's the reason most of us became lawyers. In recent change, there has been a change in and shift in client mindset, change in economics, change in um, financial pressures, creating measurable and scalable processes, black and white cost analysis. The, cre the key ingredient in every lawyer, that's passion and creativity, has slowly faded, leaving us as project managers, legal project managers, um, repeating the same tasks and processes instead of creatively uh, resolving problems and creatively leading a legal project and leaving about let's say 5% of exciting lawyering to the lawyers. But this isn't a soap opera of everything that's gone wrong. In my opinion, nothing went wrong. We just slowed down with the pressures of life and the pressures of keeping up with our jobs. And every other industry grew faster than we did. And there is one simple reason for that. They utilized technology. They started automation. And they started growing faster. And we were left with trying to keep up by still keeping the essence of the legal industry, which is your one-on-one -on -one focus and attention, thinking that if we adapted any sort of technology, it would take away from the 
personalness of what we do, from the human connection of what we do. So with, with all of these technological advancements, um, everybody's kind of economic status has continued to grow, including ours, but not necessarily our lawyering skills. But these two concepts aren't uh, competing concepts. In today's age of technology, we can have personal economic benefits, contribute to social causes benefiting society, and personal happiness, and they all can coexist. This is my favorite saying that says, do something that you love every day. So I want you guys to think about your daily jobs and think of the one thing that you do that you truly love. And I'm sure none of you are gonna think about typing or drafting documents. What is the one thing about your job that you truly love? And how could repetitive and boring tasks, we'll stay here, and how can repetitive and boring tasks cause you unhappiness? And why does unhappiness affect your job? And why does it even matter in the workplace? So the brain is a record of your past experiences. Each experience, each task, each person has an emotion attached to it. So if you keep on doing on a daily basis what you hate, if you keep on repeating that one task that pushes your button, that button, button ends up bringing the human emotion, the stress that will affect your work product as humans, as any living organisms. You can only live under stress or survive under stress for so long. Survival is basically the opposite of creation. Creation is what lawyers are. Creations is what we do. Creation and creativity is, is what lies at the foundation of any case, any argument, anything new. So survival is the exact opposite. You become automated, you become the robot, you become the person who's on autopilot. Imagine waking up every morning at the same time same side of bed, checking your email as soon as you wake up, your social media, you check your phone, you get on in your car, you don't even remember how you got to work. You don't remember the route, you don't remember the roads, you've been automated, you've been now programmed to follow this routine that you've been doing for so long. Now, you get to work, you deal with the same type of work, you deal with the same type of people and the same type of problems and issues. Now, if no analytical thinking, if no creativity is coming out either on a daily basis or at least often enough to let go of this stress, you're not really being what you kind of signed up to be. So why is happiness important at work? Lawyering is analytics. Lawyering is creation. Lawyering is passion. So economists have carried out a number of experiments to test the idea that happy employees work harder. Through experiments, they found that happiness made people around 12% more productive. Now, I've had some conversations with you guys, and I've heard some of you talk, and there's a huge amount of resources and, and, and pressure going on to you guys as general counsels to kind of lower, lower, lower the spend, legal spend, uh, bring up efficiency, and kind of bring the work inside to, again, lower costs. So how do you do that? There's multiple ways. You can bring in new business. You can, I don't, um, anything that you guys can think of. Or you can just improve efficiency of your current resources, your current employees, yourself, and you create a bigger profit margin. That's, that's a form of revenue production in, in any business. So let's go back. We're not ready for this one, you guys will laugh. <laughs> so you may not love your job and you may not believe that there's anything in your daily tasks that you'll love, but trust me, there's just, you'll find one thing and all you have to do is focus on that one thing. But it might sound kind of overwhelming to have to sit there and do that, so I found a different way of looking at it to make it kind of easier for you. The different way of looking at it is to find the most hated tasks. Think about the few things that you hate doing the most and let's start delegating that off of your plate to whoever. We'll find out who to who, but if you start eliminating these stressors out of your life and out of your job, your job is gonna go back to being something that you truly enjoy. And I'm making this assumption that you don't enjoy 100% of your job, but that's just natural for, for any career. 
So we've surveyed over 3,000 of our own clients, and we found the top 10 most hated tasks by, by legal staff. So if we get to something that you can relate to, just let me know. This is the first one. 45% said that they hate attending meetings. Now, that's a problem. Collaboration is, is very important in any business, especially in ours. So why do people hate it so much? They feel like it's a waste of time. They feel like they get nothing out of it, and they feel like they retain nothing afterwards. For lawyers especially, we feel that our time is also more valuable. If there is no additional fact, no additional help being added, no value added, why would you want to sit through a meeting and hear people, let's just say, gossip? 45% of executives say that attending meetings accomplish nothing. That's a huge chunk of numbers saying that. As, as executives, as C-level executives, which, which you guys are, other people are looking up to you. They want to learn from you, they want to collaborate with you. But doing it in a face-to-face -face type of setting is wasting a lot of people time, people's time because that one you know, factor information you're sharing might not apply to everyone. Now a solution to that. We went back. All right. You guys can all work in a simple, single ecosystem or environment and collaborate all together. Whether it's with your team, with other departments, or outside counsel, you can all be in the same platform. You can share notes, you can make comments, you can carry conversations in a place where it's saved. There is no deniability, there is no, no you didn't tell me, I don't remember, I forgot to take notes, there's no following up, I told you to do this, you didn't. No, none of that is there anymore. Now, you might think it's less personal, but let's just compare examples. Is FaceTiming your grandmother for her birthday less personal than sending a card in the mail? FaceTime is in real time, it's face to face, it's uh, a technological alternative to an indirect, restricted, traditional process. So depending on where you stand on any use of technology, it's actually just as personal, if not a little bit more. The second most hated thing is reviewing documents. 33% of legal staff members, and this includes your legal staff and your lawyers, say that they hate reviewing, reviewing long documents. Now, I'm sure you guys have all heard this joke. A lawyer is a person who calls it, who drafts a 10,000 word document and calls it a brief. Now you have to sit there as the lawyer and review this brief. How often do you have to manually review documents? Really long, wordy documents. This one was the top voted from the top four accounting firms uh, by their employees. 33% it, is actually kind of average because that threw off our numbers, but it's a huge, huge percentage. Now, to have a solution for that, you can automate this entire process. There's no need to sit there and read and just, and when I say read, most of us skim, right? You're looking for something, you're looking for a keyword, you know what you're looking for, you skim. That entire process can be automated. You can actually have conditions created to have documents reviewed. If you're doing this manually, chances are, and I think earlier this morning, I forget who was talking about um, uh, self-driving cars. It's automated, but it takes away the human error factor. It takes away the tired at night, keeping, trying to keep your eyes open when you brought a ginormous case home to just review and look for a certain document. If you can automate that, that it will save time, it will save money, you won't need as much staff, and you will have your precious time. Let's not even say you'll put it back into work. Maybe you can take a trip. The next most hated thing is speaking to customers or inside employees, just interaction with other team members. Now, boring, repetitive, predictable questions over the phone or chains and chains and chains of emails are really annoying and time consuming. You know, as uh, general counsels and as in-house counsels, you guys get a lot of the same, you know, mostly in HR related problems, mostly immigration, you get the same question over and over. And the answer is simple, it's the same answer to everyone over and over, but nobody's gonna take the time and go read your FAQ, especially if, if you're an attorney and it's a legal question. They want your advice, they want to think that this is specific to their problem. 
They're going to keep asking the follow-up questions. But in my case, and you keep saying the same thing and say, but I did it this way. And you say, nope, it's still the same result. But they just want to keep doing the but and be differentiated. Now, they might need the one-on-one -on -one attention if you were an hourly billable attorney. But as in-house employees, you just want to solve their problem fast, quick, efficiently for the company, for yourself, for them too. So the solution for that is to create and kind of replicate yourself or clone yourself with a bot. Have the bot answer all of the questions. Have the bot send them to the FAQ. Have the bot qualify them for something. And if there's still a question necessary, they can schedule a meeting. You can take the follow-up. This just got rid of probably 90% of these repetitive questions, where really only maybe 10% of legal problems are you know, new, creative, and require your one-on-one -on -one attention. The next one, 46% <laughs> of people say that they hate speaking to their bosses. They're not ready to answer follow-up questions. They have vague answers for their bosses. They embellish the current statuses or the truth. Hey, what, when was the last time you saw this case? Oh, I'm on top of it, it's going great. You check the status, somehow, maybe you find the file and check the status. They haven't touched it in months. And a thousand and one excuse competition, and let's not even get there. Why isn't this done? And you know, waste your time, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, waste of their time, now lying, now relationship problems. What's the point? You can just follow a case or be a part of a case within the same platform, within the same tech tool as everybody else. You can answer the same questions, you can check their work, you can check the statuses, you can run reports, and there's no room for, excuse my language, bullshit. You don't have to hear from them, you don't have to talk to them, unless it's really a productive conversation. If they want to come to you for strategy, they can. If they want to, um, I don't know, report something different, they can. But they don't have to, and you don't have to spend your time doing that. Now, the highest and worst percentage, manual data entry. I can't think of anyone who loves doing this except court reporters. I mean, who, I, I can't think of anyone who loves typing. And we're lawyers. I mean, if you're hiring a lawyer, do you check their typing speed or do you check their creativity in solving a legal problem? You give them a legal issue to solve. That's how you know if you want this person or not. You check their reputation. I highly doubt that you're going to call the last firm they were at and say, how fast can this person type? If anything, we discourage typing in the legal industry with the old dictaphones. And now, that there has to be a better replacement for the dictaphone, for the outsourcing of it, for the typing of it through a staff. Essentially, it's the manual work. So workflows can take care of this. You have to have a system where it will take the data, save it, and allow you to reuse it in a more faster, better, more efficient way. And that's the simplest solution for the biggest problem. And the, I don't think it's the last one, but it's still a quite a high number, and most lawyers hate time tracking. And I kind of looked up most of you and read your profiles, and you were at some point outside, or I've talked to some legal departments where they require their people to still track their, their time, whether, whether they're billing or not. And for my job, that's the most annoying thing I ever did. The fact that you make one phone call and you have to log a point one. The point one to log is taking longer than the conversation or the act of dialing and trying to get a hold of the client. So typical lawyers will often either record their time once a day, if they're better, if, if they're slower, once a week, or in my case, where I do things last minute and I'm a procrastinator, the day before the deadline. You try to get everything in, and you don't remember what work you did. You open your file, you start looking, and you think, all right, I drafted this letter, I don't remember how long it took me, what does it take to do two pages, and it becomes arbitrary. And this is, this is part of the waste and resources on the legal department side, because this is what's happening on the outside counsel's side. They're not as focused on innovation. They're not as um, focused on growth and, and a global uh, company. They're focused on hitting their billables. They're focused on taking care of their clients. They're, they're focused on keeping your account, which means if you're auditing them and if you're reading and trying to find all case statuses through their bills, which you know, in, for most insurance companies, that's what they did, 
to try to see what cases are being worked on, it's not really a true representation of the quality of work. It's just a thing an associate had to do to get something in, to meet their billables. Is it quality work? Did it really drive the case in any direction that will benefit you? I'm not sure, maybe just a small percentage of it, but not everything else. Those are just billables. And most legal departments, a lot of legal departments, I shouldn't say most, are using just the billing um, breakdown to kind of stay up to date with cases. And we'll get to reporting and I'll talk more about that. But there is a solution out there and I mean we have one, there's just a billing system. A billing and time tracking system where it could automate this process. Uh, there's a lot of tools out there that we use now machine learning to kind of predict based on your personal habits or the task how much um, you can bill for it or what amount of time it'll take. On the legal department side, if you have this system as a requirement for your outside counsel, it will really allow you to set billing rules where it will eliminate the need for bill review because beforehand you've already set the billing rules and you've put them on a road that they can't steer from. You don't have to go back and check it. Here are my rules, here's my system. You work in there on an ongoing and real-time basis. You guys can audit them and not have to deal with the bill later and then cut them later and, and have to go through this friction in the relationship. It's important to have a good, honest, transparent relationship with outside counsels. Money always complicates things. Billing always complicates things. So it takes away from a little bit of the trust factor and your relationship with the outside counsel. Okay, now taking notes. 34% hate taking notes. I promise you it's probably not the attorneys as I've sat here today and watched most of you take notes, probably for fun, or learn something new. You guys read for fun, you probably read case law for fun, you take notes on, on it and margins, margins, but that's really not a common trait for humanity and everybody out there, especially in, in other practice areas. So how often has it happened that you're in a meeting, you're discussing strategy, and you say, do this next, do this next, do this next. Three weeks later, a month later, you have the same meeting, and you repeat the same thing, and you say, what happened? And they say, you know, you never told me. It's always, I don't know, the, the I don't know game, the I don't remember game, the I wrote it somewhere and I can't find it, and you have to repeat yourself over and over and over. Versus, if you can leave notes and comments on a certain specific task, not a big strategy, not a whole direction of a case, not a meeting that 10 people are in, but specifically be able to review and talk to individuals about specific tasks, whether you're internal employees or an outside counsel. You know, your, as inside counsels, your strategy of handling a case are different. Uh, sometimes your goals don't align with the outside counsel. Their goal is to maximize billables while still keeping you happy and maybe, you know, winning the case or litigating the case longer to keep the case open. And your strategy is to keep the costs low, keep the co cases moving fast, and find a solution that benefits everyone. Mostly you, but benefits everyone. It's, it's more of a win-win look versus let me test my abilities while I bill you at your expense. So the strategy is different. If you can have a conversation, if you can have transparency in what's going on within the case, you can have a better control and, and better abilities to direct the outcome of a case. Okay. The next one is processing documents. And I'm guilty of this. I'm sure when you need a document or something that you've previously drafted, there's probably no one place that you're gonna find it. You're gonna go through, search an old file, bring up the case, delete some of the names. There are tools out there now that will get rid of everything, create you questionnaires where you don't even have to fill it out. Let's say, let alone your staff, you can have outside counsel, you can have clients directly fill it out. That means the data is inputted one time. And it answers questionnaires and will assemble documents for you without anyone ever needing to click within a document to change anything. Imagine how much time that saves. Imagine how many errors that will correct. Because if you're copy pasting something or deleting something, if you take out that one word or if you accidentally delete that one clause, 
that will change the entire meaning of that legal document. If it's a contract, you may be screwed. If it's some other, uh, let's just say, um, Pleading, if you left out a cause of action because you accidentally deleted it, you didn't fix the numbers correctly, you didn't fill the margins correctly. You don't have to worry about any of that. You just have to answer simple questions based on a template that you've one time sat down and built. That means your work product, your strategies can be replicated and repeated by your staff or by outside counsel. That means your quality of work and your thought process can be passed on to the next person. And I think we were talking about that this morning too, the, the shift in being able to train outside counsels and, and young attorneys, and um, I think it may have been one of you guys who said um, that maybe in the next 10 years there's gonna be inside counsels going outside just because of the shift in experience. If you have good documentation, which you know, we're supposed to have, which we don't usually, or organized, or have our work processes and our, and our thought process replicated into a system, or into a process that can be shared. That means more and more attorneys can replicate your work and learn from you, not individually, not having to shadow you, and not you having to spend your day trying to teach someone. They can take a process and adapt it as their own. <sighs> Reporting. I don't think I should say anything about this. Most reports that are generated, if on time, they're inaccurate, they're subjective, and they're based on data that by the time you receive the report and you're reviewing it, it's already out of date. So the solution to this is to have auto-generated reports. If you're all in the same system, inside counsel, outside counsel, the entire staff, they can be auto-generated reports, and this isn't a new concept. If you've seen any kind of sales CRM systems, you can have triggers where you can get your email sent to you, let's say every Friday. So you don't have to wait for a quarter or for a month to just get a simple case status report. That might not even be accurate. That doesn't have all of the information. You can have auto-generated reports based on any data you're looking for. This can be employee profitability. This can be outside counsel time spent to be able to compare firms to firms, lawyers to lawyers, to really find the expert, the most efficient, the most cost um, kind of I was gonna say cost saving, but let's not go that, down that road, but making a decision to work with someone is based on so many factors. It might be that it's a more expensive outside counsel, but they have the highest success rate on, on that type of a thing. And now you have this data to help you make actual business decisions by the reports that you create, not what they think you want to know, which is a column of case names and the last action. And last but not least, requesting time off. You know, at my old firm when I did litigation, nobody cared if I was in the office or not or if I traveled or not as long as I met my billing requirements. We were paper-based, so that means sometimes I left the firm with a cart of 30 cases and I would make a couple of trips and fill my car because I lived really far away from the office and I would go and I would work and I would bill. But first of all, I removed confidential files, don't quote me on this, from the firm I was allowed and second, I had no way of checking in with anyone, sharing my work from anyone, getting advice from anyone, or even sending anything out. So I was just working and producing, and I would go back to work a week or two later after having time off, and now everything was late. In, in, in my world, things work fast. So if I did a hearing, and then I had a hearing report due, and that didn't go out the day after, or two days after, it was late. But with the firm process of dictations and everything, it, it, was, you know, it was acceptable to get things out within a week or two. Imagine you guys, as the clients, that an attorney went to a hearing and you don't know for two weeks later of what happened because they took a trip and it's paper-based and how are they gonna send a letter to you? They usually don't email. Even if they do, they're not gonna send you document in, documents in it, which they shouldn't, it's insecure communications anyway. But they do, that's how it works. Now if you're working um, remotely or virtually or with any sort of technology, you're working from anywhere, anytime. So it's, it's really um, selling the stream life of being on the beach with your laptop and having the same lifestyle be available to anybody else who's working with you, even the outside counsel. 
the happier, remember the, in the beginning we saw it, the happier they are, the more productive they are, the more efficient they are. So by you guys implementing a process that can be repeatable, that can be scalable, it will actually increase efficiency, it will save you money, and it will improve your own quality of life, your own happiness. So, with this just list of 10, I think I just eliminated or delegated 90% of tasks that attorneys do. Now, most of them can be delegated to robots. You don't have to hire anybody else. And these are some of the examples, and I think I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna try to get through and you guys can read the slides. Most of these tasks and every single one on the top 10 list that I mentioned can be automated. Not a little bit automated, fully automated. But the important thing is to realize that it's baby steps. You don't want to halt your practice, bring in a whole sea of softwares, and I call it software zoo, to try to automate everything. Then that becomes your full-time job. It's baby steps. It's implementing something. Maybe it will make you 10 seconds faster on a task. Maybe it will make you 20 seconds faster on a task. What would that add up to at the end of the week, at the end of the month? So little by little, you have to find the thing that you hate the most, find the solution for that, get rid of that, implement the next. Try to you know, solve a solution, and at the end of it, maybe it'll take a year, maybe it'll take two years, but it's an investment. It's an investment that's actually gonna be scalable, profitable, and help you grow as attorneys, as you know, humans from your quality of life standpoint. So, the last thing, you things, I will say, is to let lawyers, let's keep going, let lawyers be lawyers and hire robots and restore the essence of the legal industry, which comes back to passion, creativity, and analytical thinking, which is why we all, I hope all of us, went to law school for, otherwise it was you know, a seven year investment that didn't pay off. So as lawyers, we're trained to look into the past, precedent, set a goal in the future, and try to navigate towards that vision. It's to be able to create a present and nudge the laws and the society in the right direction. Now it's time for us to do that for ourselves. So now we talked about how traditionally everything was done, technology representing the future, and how we can bring that in to affect our present and to nudge the legal industry in the right direction. We're back to where it used to be, which is about true lawyering. It wasn't about cost analysis, to settle cases that should be litigated to set an example. Every case that's settled will set an example for another frivolous case that will, will kind of push the other one and push the other one and it will create the circle and you'll just become a robot settling everything. Not really creating any new law, not really doing what you need to do that you know in your heart and mind is the correct thing to do. So with technology, you can clone yourself, your experience, your strategy, your best documents, your best drafting practices, your best litigation practices, whatever it is with just a few clicks. And to create an efficient, accurate, repeatable, and scalable process for generations to come. So I'll end with this. Success to me is a chance to have my passion be impactful on restoring a system that has shaped human behavior for decades though slowly has fallen behind the societal curve. Of course I do this with the purest intention of wanting to put back fairness and justice into the system, but I'll leave you with one question. What's success to you?